And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the Mayor of the City of Burlington and Chair of AMO's Climate Change Task Force, Rick Goldring. Well, good morning, everyone. What a great looking crowd out there. I know nobody's tired. Everybody's full of energy and wants to hear about some different perspectives about climate change. But good morning, everyone. My name is Rick Golding, the mayor of the city of Burlington. I serve on the AMO executive. And as was mentioned, I'm the chair of AMO's Climate Change Task Force. So the session I'm chairing this morning is entitled Climate Change Going Forward. For many years, AMO has represented the interests of municipal governments in climate change. In particular, we have signed an agreement with the Union of Quebec Municipalities to coordinate our work on climate change. AMO's Climate Change Task Force, which I chaired, developed recommendations for the provincial government, many of which were reflected in the recent Climate Change Action Plan. Climate change continues to challenge us. It requires us to rethink how we have typically done work. However, it may also present us with significant opportunities to innovate, use resources more efficiently, and develop our economies and to have a cleaner environment. So this session is about how we can meet some of those challenges and turn them into opportunities. We will hear from industry representatives, rural communities, and home builders on what the future may hold. But before I introduce the speakers, I would like to take the opportunity to thank our sponsor of this particular session, the Cement Association of Canada. Let's give them a hand. So now to our panelists. Our first panelist is Michael McSweeney. Michael McSweeney just happens to be president and CEO of the Cement Association of Canada, which is sponsoring this session, and more importantly, a reception last night before the barbecue. Uh, he serves as a director of the Athena Sustainable Materials Institute, and in 2015 was appointed by Premier Wynne to the Ontario Climate Change Action Group and asked by the Alberta Minister of Environment to co-chair a stakeholder panel on climate change. Mr. McSweeney has worked in the private and public sector for 30 years, including the CEO of the Standards Council of Canada. He was an Ottawa City Councillor. He formerly was Vice President of Environment and Public Affairs for Bennett Environment and a Vice President of Business Development for Archers Daniels Midland. Mr. McSweeney holds an MBA from the Ivy School of Business at the University of Western Ontario, as well as a Master's in Public Administration from Harvard University. Our next uh, speaker will be Norman Rugatli, is the Director of the Policy and Stakeholder Engagement with the Rural Ontario Institute. Norman began his career in the nonprofit sector organizing environmental advocacy campaigns, and following this, he worked in municipal government for 10 years as a planner on an award-winning sustainable community program. Norm spent a decade with the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, supporting rural community economic development, and Norman has a master's in rural planning and development from the University of Guelph and is volunteer chair of the Ontario Farmland Trust, and he makes his home on the shores of Georgian Bay in beautiful Gray County. Our next speaker will be Jennifer Weatherston. She's the third panelist, and she is the Director of Innovation and Estimating at Reed's Heritage Homes. Jennifer leads Reed's Heritage Homes Net Zero program, which involves building homes across the country which produce as much energy as they consume. Jennifer has worked with her team to find scalable, cost-effective products and designs that offer sustainability and durability to the end users. To date, five net zero homes have been built, all of which qualify under the Canadian Home Builders Association Net Zero Energy Labeling Program Pilot and have led to Reed's Heritage Homes achieving Net Zero Builder of the Year. So after the speakers have made their presentations, I will kick off the questions and open it up to the floor if time allows for, for Q&A. And I will now invite uh, all the uh, panelists to come out here and Michael McSweeney to come right to the podium uh, to make his presentation. So each of them will have 15 minutes and 15 minutes for Q&A after that. So let's welcome all our presenters. Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great to be, be up here again this morning. Good to get the slides up, I can see them. Uh, I was invited here 
to talk broadly about what ch climate change means for municipal governments in particular and how climate change is an opportunity for you as municipalities to think, to invest differently in community infrastructure to the benefit of local economies and local environment. First, let me put some context to what I believe is society's greatest challenge. Most people in this room are likely familiar with, in political terms, how quickly the discussion on climate change has evolved over the past few years. Most recently, the meetings that took place in Paris, known as COP21, erased any doubt that the international community acknowledges what needs to be done, even if we're not sure how we're going to get there. Canada's new federal government has made climate change one of its most important priorities. In addition, and in addition to putting a national price on carbon, our planning investments, some $45 billion in low carbon and climate resilient communities and infrastructure. And leading the way to date have been provinces, the majority of whom have announced kicking my pen out of the way here, have announced some sort of carbon pricing system, be it a carbon tax, or in the case of here in Ontario, a cap and trade system, along with other initiatives which will accelerate the transition to a low carbon and climate resilient future. Ontario is a great illustration of the challenge ahead. Coal-fired electricity, which is the lowest hanging fruit in most jurisdictions around the world, but here in Ontario, we've done away with coal-fired electricity and have already benefited from these reductions, which has helped the province stay on track for its 2020 target. But even with this measure and all of the remaining measures that need to be taken, Ontario has a huge challenge to face if it needs to find 160 metric tons, megatons of GHG reductions in the next 30 to 35 years to meet its goal of an 80% reduction by 2050. On the one hand, it does sound insanely ambitious. On the other hand, the best science we have says this is what we need to do to stay in that range of two degrees warming. So how will we close this gap? Carbon pricing is the foundation of any comprehensive climate policy, but we are too late to rely on carbon pricing alone. Had we started carbon pricing in 1990, when the market-based carbon pricing mechanisms were first proposed, a low but gradually increasing carbon price might have bent the curve enough towards a low carbon economic development. We are now facing a different scenario. In jurisdictions that adopt a straight carbon tax, such as British Columbia, many economists suggest that a carbon price upwards of $200 per tonne would be needed to have any chance for us to meet our 2050 targets. Ontario, to its credit, has opted to link to a cap and trade system, which is attached to hard caps on emissions, but even here the province has recognized that a series of complementary measures will have to be taken in order for Ontario to meet its ambitious targets. We are now undeniably in the position of needing a host of other regulatory and other policy interventions in addition to carbon pricing to accelerate the transition to a low carbon economy. And this is where I think municipalities can really play a role. We tend to look at GHG reductions in discrete wedges as you can see here on the screen, but they are all highly interrelated. There isn't a single wedge on Ontario's sector by sector GHG emission chart that doesn't interface in an important way with decisions we make about how we build, how we design, and how we maintain our buildings, roads, and other infrastructures in our municipalities. In looking at the graph, we can see that heating our buildings with fossil fuels accounts for about 19% of Ontario's emissions. This increases to about 25% when we account for a building share of electricity use. Transportation accounts for almost a third of GHG emissions in Ontario. 
some of which relates to the pavements we design our roads with. And I'll discuss that in a few minutes. Most people are surprised to know that industry accounts for only 28% of the emissions. Looking closely, almost one third of the industry's emissions or 10% of all emissions in the province are from building material industries, cement, iron, and steel. So one of the places we're going to have to look very closely at in order to meet our targets for 2030 and 2050 is our built environment. And that's where you play a key role. Municipalities are at the epicenter of these three GHG emission wedges, buildings, road transportation, and the materials that we need to build them. I've, I've pinched this slide, whoops. Yeah, I've pinched this slide from the Athena Sustainable Material Institute. It basically illustrates where we can find carbon in buildings and infrastructure. Operational energy, the energy we use to heat, cool and power our buildings, accounts for up to 90% of a building's GHG emissions on a life cycle basis. Roadway surface related fuel use, leaving aside vehicle technologies which will come into play in the next uh, decade. The Massachusetts Institute technology suggests up to 7% of road transport fuel use could be wasted due to using soft asphalt pavements rather than rigid concrete pavements. I'm sure you all know when the temperature hits 25 to 35 degrees and you're seeing buses and heavy trucks rolling down your major intersections, you actually see the grooves in the, in the, in the pavement that are formed in the summer. And that's because asphalt is a soft surface, you ride into that surface. Concrete is a rigid surface, you ride on top of it. So that's where MIT suggests we could get 7% better fuel efficiency by having more rigid surfaces in our communities. Construction materials account for over two megatons for non-residential GHG emissions. Asset management is also increasingly important in a world where our buildings and infrastructure are at risk of extreme weather. The more resilient we build, the less cost and environmental impact from repair and rebuilding after extreme events. Finally, end-of-life impacts are also very significant for biogenic products like wood that also, when they are put into a landfill, decay and release methane. Of course, if we build things once, if we build things right, and if we build them to last, that's the key to true sustainability. So how do we tackle this challenge? The first step is to admit we have a problem with how we make our decisions today. And as I've said to you before, I, I sat where you sit. And so I know that we generally pursue a low cost, low value strategy when we are making decisions to award tenders to the low cost bidder. So how do we move away from this strategy? When you award tenders based on low cost and not high value, the slide you see on the screen is the potential outcome. So what's the answer? There's a need to move to a more comprehensive decision-making process where every, de every decision you make is taken through two lens. The first lens is climate change. You need to take decisions that values GHG reductions and climate resilience. This is the only way we will get to our 37% reduction by 2030 and our 80% reduction by 2050. In the time that I have left, I want to look at this from the perspective of buildings and roads and offer you a perspective on some of the solutions that the concrete industry is putting forward. This slide is, typical, is the typical emissions profile of a building. We need to codify the significant opportunities that already exist to reduce the amount of carbon emitted to build these assets. For example, the embodied carbon. Even more importantly, given these buildings will be around for 30, 50, or 100 years or more, if you choose to build buildings with wood, it's going to be significantly less. So I encourage you to build with concrete buildings. That's why I'm the sponsor of this session. But if you do build, 
You know, we, we all want to travel to London, England. Some of us like to go to London, Ontario too, but London, England, Paris, Rome, anywhere in Europe. And we look at the magnificent buildings there and all of those buildings are built with stone and concrete and, and not with wood. So if you want to build it once, build it right, build it to last, uh, I encourage you to look at concrete buildings. We need, where possible, to design these assets to reduce carbon over their operational lives. We introduced, as I talked about on Monday, a new cement called Contempra to the Canadian market about five years ago. It reduces greenhouse gases on that specific project, whether it's um, an a municipal building, whether it's a sidewalk, whether it's a pavement, whether it's a stadium, it reduces the greenhouse gases on that project by 10%, and there is no cost premium for this product. It has been approved for use by the Ontario Building Code as a replacement for regular cement in almost all applications. Contemporary projects in Ontario, and I chose the ones from my hometown of Ottawa to talk about, are the recent uh, Lansdowne Park redevelopment and the Ottawa Light Rail Transit, uh, which is currently under construction. Both of these projects are using the new cement Contempra, one above ground, one below ground. MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology study showed that passive energy efficiency benefits of concrete's thermal mass which provides efficiency gains of up to 8% over other building materials, more than make up for the embodied impacts of cement and concrete in the manufacturing process. More importantly, real world examples show that integrating concrete's thermal mass as a design strategy and pairing it with passive and or active radiant and cooling systems can reduce in the energy use in buildings and related GHG emissions by over 70% over the model national energy code for buildings. A showcase example of energy efficiency improvement that can be achieved by integrating concrete's thermal mass with green design and technology is the, this building that you see here before you, the LEED Platinum Certified Manitoba Hydro Place in Winnipeg. And if Glenn Murray had been here this morning uh, to talk about it, I'm sure he would have raised uh, that issue uh, when he was mayor of Winnipeg. It was his proudest accomplishments. This building, uh, in Winnipeg has one of the most energy efficient uh, profiles for a large office tower in North America. In one of the most demanding climates in North America where seasonal temperatures ra range from minus 35 in the winter to plus 35 in the summer. An important consideration in this climate is also the concept of passive survivability. Concrete improves a building's ability to maintain critical support conditions if services such as power, heating, fuel, or water are lost. And just to give you some examples of this building, it's about uh, 65,000 meters, 23 stories high, has passive solar heating, and a mechanical design used cast in place concrete structure for radiant floor heating and cooling, and also combines extensive geothermal energy systems uh, all to come together to make this, as I said earlier, one of the most energy efficient buildings um, and, uh, in uh, Canada. And uh, I think I mentioned uh, also that it has achieved energy efficiency of about 70%. And for Manitoba Hydro Place, that equates to $500,000 in savings per year. The cost of less durable construction can be high, both financial and emotionally, for the owners of damaged buildings. Concrete is durable, non-combustible, and not moisture sensitive, or subject to changes in deterioration from rot, mold, insect, rain, wind, flood damage. In the aftermath of uh, major weather events like the 2013 floods in Alberta, concrete structures, were, concrete structures were proven to be very resilient. At a time when we are coping with an aging and decaying infrastructure, when extreme weather events are becoming the new normal, and when urban densification is becoming a priority, we need to be looking for enhanced resiliency for our buildings. Beyond the best in class resilient, energy efficiency, durability, quality benefits of concrete, its non-combustibility, all represent a distinct advantage for municipalities. The fact that concrete buildings don't burn reduces the demand, for example, for firefighting services. Whereas we see all too often 
wood structures uh, five stories or higher will require more firefighting resources, putting greater pressures on municipalities and their constrained budgets. For example, some municipalities will need to purchase new ladder trucks at a cost of approximately a million dollars each and will also increase the required number of, number of specially trained firefighting personnel in order to protect those who live in that building and the neighbourhoods surrounding it. Buildings are a relatively complex project, but life cycle accounting is actually very accessible and straightforward for other types of infrastructure, including roads. When making decisions about roads being designed, built and maintained, it's essential to consider environmental impacts throughout the entire roadway life cycle. Using life cycle accounting to examine the environmental impacts of a functionally equivalent asphalt and concrete pavement over a 50 year period will clearly demonstrate to you that concrete outperforms asphalt from the environmental burden perspective. As a side note, it's important to know that although suitable for lower volume roadways, asphalt pavements may not be always the most cost effective alternative when comparing life cycle costs. Concrete pavements often are less costly than asphalt pavements based on the initial costs for heavily trafficked roads. I might add that the last, last 10 or 12 400 series projects from the Ministry of Transportation in Ontario have all been awarded to concrete because they were the lowest at first cost. Examples show that the initial cost of concrete pavement for a major arterial roadway is 10% less than asphalt pavement. You may be surprised to hear that and I often get asked, well, why won't our staff recommend that we go with a concrete pavement? And I always say, you know, it's because they're so used to just going to the drawer where, where they keep the specs from the last time that road was tendered. So you have to push your staff and get them to really start thinking outside the box. So when you consider the cost to maintain a pavement over a 50 year period, there's an overall savings of 20% per lane kilometer. And if the climate benefits aren't enough to convince you, the cost, as I said, should be. Experience shows that a competitive environment will allow you to pave more kilometers for the same amount of money. A competitive two pavement system will lower prices. It will spur innovation and it will improve quality. So we're asking that you always call for alternate design and alternate, uh, um, God, al <laughs> alternate, alternate design bids so that you can have bids that uh, are both concrete and asphalt. More competition equals more roadways paved with the same investment with a huge potential to reduce greenhouse gases. This is not an abstract concept. It can and has been operationalized. There are tools that municipalities can use today to help guide decision making for low carbon infrastructure. In summary, what can you as municipalities do in the help, in the help of, to fight against climate change? In a nutshell, we believe that you should mandate the use of life cycle cost analysis for municipal buildings, pavements, and other transportation infrastructure. You should open your pavement tendering process to alternative bids so that lower lasting, lower HG, more resilient concrete could be considered as an option. You should mandate the use in your municipality of the lower GHG cement contempora for all of your concrete projects in your municipality. And that you should consider the role of municipal permitting that can, can play to foster more energy efficient and more resilient buildings. And mandate the integrated energy efficient strategies for municipal buildings, as well as for community density strategies. As I travel the country, I see many uh, communities uh, that are saying, uh, that they want buildings built to a higher standard than the building code. We all know that the building code is the lowest common denominator. It's not the highest common denominator. So you as municipal politicians have a right for this generation and future generations to call on developers and builders to build to the, a higher builder, building standard and hold your municipalities up to reducing greenhouse gases um, as you build infrastructure going forward. 
So it's been a real uh, pleasure being here today and I look forward to uh, taking any questions after my colleagues have spoken. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my uh, role here today is to try to provide a bit of a rural perspective on uh, the opportunities of climate change. And um, I just wanted to start, I guess, with what people jump to in, uh, when they think about climate change and opportunities, because we often think of the, the issues and the challenges. But, uh, you know, the length of the growing season is, is one um, predicted uh, outcome of climate change. This uh, on the left there is sort of the baseline um, current conditions of the length of the growing season in Ontario, clearly down in the brown patch in southwestern Ontario where we are, it's, it's longer. Um, and then as you go north, it, it shortens. And that's going to change over time. The, the other um, map, this is from OMAFRA uh, modeling, um, we're going to see that, that line um, change and places like Prescott Russell are going to be able to grow things that can grow down in Chatham-Kent. So um, those are r real opportunities for some agricultural operators, for sure. But uh, the flip side is uh, we're going to see changes in precipitation, um, more droughty summers and wetter springs. So whether or not, you know, there's going to be winners and losers, um, obviously, and, think and investments that are going to be made by uh, agricultural operators to accommodate these changes, and um, uh, hopefully there'll be net benefit. But what I think, from my perspective, I, I can speak most meaningfully to today is not, you know, the predictions of, of uh, the winners and losers, I guess, in climate change, but really the opportunity we have, the policy opportunity we have, um, to invest the money that's going to be collected through cap and trade in programs that, yes, reduce greenhouse gases, but that also um, benefit rural stakeholders. And um, we've been told by the government that um, the, the policy framework for investment is incomplete, that the, there's more announcements and program design coming under the Green in Investment Fund, so this is an immediate and present opportunity. Um, I'm also going to try to make the case that uh, the geographic impact of cap and trade uh, will be felt disproportionately in rural Ontario. And I think the challenge then becomes, will the uh, investment be similarly uh, disproportionate. So just to look at that uh, uh, and build that case, um, on, the, on the left is uh, um, a comparison of rural and urban spending at a household level. This is uh, Statistics Canada uh, family expenditure data, um, uh, looking at various forms of energy and what uh, the average household spends. Um, you can see that uh, three out of the four there, um, rural households are spending a significant higher proportion of their incomes on energy. And on the right are the anticipated increases in uh, costs of energy that the government has uh, suggested as it will be result from cap and trade. So clearly the rural household is going to be um, spending more of its uh, resources um, on those increased costs than the average uh, urban household. And this is in a context when rural incomes are 15% are lower uh, on average than, than urban incomes. So the consequences are uh, real and um, meaningful for, for rural stakeholders. Um, what this doesn't, what this data doesn't speak to is, is the impact on business. Um, but we do know that the Ontario economy, the rural economy, is much more oriented at goods production. Uh, goods production means material movement. And there's a lot of um, um, diesel in the, in the rural economy. Um, we saw the, the earlier graph um, about the proportion of, of our greenhouse gas emissions in the province that come from use of diesel. And because of the nature of the rural economy, that is definitely going to be a challenge for, for rural businesses. Um, the other aspect is just where the large emitters are. And um, if you look at a list of the industries that are going to be regulated under cap and trade, close to half of them are in rural regions of the province. So. Um, to the extent that those uh, smelters and pulp and paper mills and so on are major regional employers in our, in our rural economy, uh, the flow-through effects of um, 
changes to their bottom line um, may be felt in those local economies. So for all those reasons, I think it's very important that when we look at the policy of the government from an investment perspective, we also look at how is this benefiting rural stakeholders. And in that context, I, I wanted to just uh, reflect on the lessons we learned from the Green Energy Act. And, you know, the, the implementation of that over the various iterations of the FIT program and so on, um, it became clear that part of the dialogue we had in the province, if I can characterize it as dialogue, uh, was that some people were ve feeling very strongly that they were suffering the impacts but not sharing the, their revenues. And I think we have an opportunity with cap and trade to not take that same similar kind of approach. In California, that's a bit ahead of us, of course, in cap and trade and that we're part of the same market. Uh, they've got legislation where 25% of their cap and trade revenue is directed at what they call uh, impacted communities. It's a complicated formula for how they figure out which place is impacted, but the reality is that they're specifically directing their cap and trade revenue into those jurisdictions that they think are impacted. The other thing we learned from the Green Energy Act and, and um, was that uh, you know the, the early players got um, more benefit um, than the later players that came into the um, under fit contracts and a lot of the later players are the community projects, the co-ops or the P3s that um, we see um, that take time to structure the partnerships and due diligence where feasibility analysis is needed for investment of public money. So uh, I would say again that from that perspective, um, if we can structure our um, provincial programs so that there's money for feasibility analysis and so on so that uh, local governments can take advantage of those programs that would be better and uh, district heating systems and so on will likely uh, evolve. Um, I know that Minister Souza is going to have uh, a lot of pressures um, and a lot of uh, um, decisions to make about um, where that money goes. And I think we've seen some early signals about where they're going with the Green Investment Fund. This is actually uh, taken from a press conference where Minister Souza was announcing $7 million uh, going to uh, retrofits for social housing in Peel region. And I'm sure that money would be welcome for uh, all the upper tiers that are consolidated municipal service managers and running social housing if we can um, help the, the uh, lower income elements of our community meet their utility bills, that would be great. I know in the region I'm from, in Co uh, Gray County, uh, $750,000 was spent last year alone um, supporting people that uh, couldn't pay their utility bills. So this is a, a real issue in, in many uh, rural communities. The problem with the, uh, the program though, it's a $92 million investment, 82 million of which is uh, directed at um, multi-unit residential buildings of over 150 units. And I think that threshold puts it out of reach of a lot of uh, rural communities where, in Gray County again, where I'm from, there's only one uh, facility that would qualify for that threshold. So the devil's in the details and uh, we need to get those details right going forward. Um, these are the things that the, the, the Green Investment Fund has already targeted, uh, the ways to reduce uh, our greenhouse gas uh, emissions and um, helping uh, home homeowners use less energy would certainly uh, be something that I think rural householders would, would appreciate given that cost structure I was sharing earlier. Um, however, right now uh, it's Enbridge and um, Union Gas that are partnering with the government and doing the home energy audits uh, or going to do the home energy audits. So not all parts of rural Ontario will be able to take advantage of that. And that's really uh, another geographic aspect of how we roll out this programming. Um, to be a bit more positive, I guess, there's, you know, sort of new things afoot that, that might show some prom promise in, in Ridgetown just down the road here. They're doing some research on using Phragmites as a, a feedstock for uh, anaerobic digesters, biogas, and um, that would be great kind of win-win if we can deal with the invasive species that's going to move north with climate change and, and um, you know, create uh, fuel out of it. Um, we've already got some projects that, that have landed. I think 34 out of 37 of the biodigesters in the pr province are rural and mostly agricultural based. This is a project in Oxford County. It was in Better Farming 
uh, last issue, um, and that's where I got these photos from. But the interesting aspect to this biogas project is that the fuel is actually being used for transportation fuel, and that's a win-win when you think about that, uh, that rural economy where we have to move, move goods in uh, rural Ontario. Um, looking at this maybe from a, a, a more of a northern perspective in the boreal forest, um, that green uh, slice of the uh, pie chart there is the um, carbon sink that is represented by boreal forests across the planet. It's a huge, important um, element uh, going forward in climate change. Uh, a lot of that's actually in the soils in boreal forests. But we know that the boreal forest and what happens to it is going to play a huge role in in uh, climate change in the future. Um, whether or not the cap and uh, trade system provides some offsets for afforestation or leaving some of the boreal forest intact uh, remains to be seen. And it's a very complex situation. And I, I pulled this diagram from uh, a document that the um, Council of Ministers of Forestry across the, the, the province across the country put together and all it's meant to demonstrate is that there's a huge amount of administrative uh, verification and um, certification and so on that needs to go into planning policy around this kind of thing to make sure that our, our monies are wisely spent. So I think it remains to be seen whether northern communities and the forestry industry will actually uh, benefit in, in any way from the investment of cap and trade. Storage is a, is a whole other dimension of um, our, you know, growing um, renewable energy system. Um, most storage globally um, is done by pumping water uphill when we don't need the power and uh, letting it run through turbines when we do. And um, there are going to be opportunities in different parts of the province to do that kind of thing. Um, this happens to be a German project, but there have been proposals and rural Ontario, Marmor and Lake, for example. Um, and, you know, when we come to the storage issue, we heard a lot about um, Tesla and the lithium ion batteries that are going into our vehicles that will provide storage um, as they're charged overnight and so on. But um, at least for rural Ontarians, and this is a screen grab from the government's website about where the uh, electric vehicle charging stations will be um, by 2017. You can see they're going into the more populous regions of the province, which makes a lot of sense. But I think from a rural perspective, the uptake on the electrical uh, vehicle subsidies will probably be slower in coming because of the distances and, um, uh, that we have to travel and the range that vehicles have and where the charging stations are. So again, we need to look at a, with a finer lens at, at where the investment's going to understand um, whether we can benefit or not. So just to summarize, I, um, I think that there are real opportunities with that 1.9 billion um, if we actually get there. Um, one area could be this rural homeowner retrofit uh, program, but, uh, but we need to do the design properly to get there. Uh, California spent a lot of uh, their cap and trade rev revenue on intercity um, mobility, not just uh, transit in inside uh, urban centers, um, both from a rail perspective um, and when you think about um, what's happening in southwestern Ontario with uh, adv advocacy for a return to better rail, um, this might be a, a, a good use for cap and trade um, revenues. And in in the north right now, we're going through consultation with the MTO about uh, intercity uh, mobility and busing. Um, so th this is a potential, whatever solutions come out of that um, dialogue um, might be resourced through cap and trade. Um, the Rural Ontario Institute does a lot of work with uh, rural regions uh, around community transportation and that evolving framework, uh, a lot more um, rural communities looking at investing in um, versions of public transit that, that make sense for their geographies. And uh, actually yesterday, we, with the help of MTO, we, we've uh, launched a new website and network, an Ontario Community Transportation Network. So if you're interested in that, uh, there's a new resource um, there. So, I, But the proportion of investment, let's say, in um, rural specific solutions to, to mobility is a lot less than in urban transit. Um, and, I, you know, I'd be looking for uh, a longer-term commitment to, from the government to 
you know, rural mobility solutions. I've already mentioned the, the impacted communities program. I think it, the, the question remains for Ontario whether we'll follow that approach. Um, there's promising um, interest from the government in freight movement, technology investment from cap and trade. So I think uh, we'll need to see more of that to help the, the, the rural economy. And um, that's about it. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Okay, so we are a mid-size um, production builder in the Guelph area. We also build in other areas within Ontario, um, about probably three to 400 units a year between multifamily, mid-rise, and single family. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were engaged by Intercanon Owens Corning Canada to build five net zero homes as part of a national program where 25 homes were built across Canada. The Canadian Home Builders Association has defined what net zero energy means, and it is a house that is designed, constructed, modeled to produce as much energy as it consumes on an annual basis. There are basically five key elements that lend to this, and it would be air sealing, which is probably the most critical, increased insulation from top to bottom, triple pane windows, right size mechanicals. So what that means is that you're getting a proper airflow throughout the home. You're getting a system that is not blasting on and blasting off. It's providing increased comfort. Efficient electrical, which is Energy Star appliances, LED lighting, um, different hot water tanks, different mechanicals, and renewable, which is solar on the roof. All very simple concepts that are readily available in the building market today. What this means to the home buyer when you figure what net zero um, what it costs to add on to your mortgage versus what you're going to save in payments will actually put money back in your pocket. But it also gives you a couple other key points. Health, it's going to uh, reduce allergens because you don't have outside air coming in. You have uh, cleaner air because you have an HRV, so it's providing that fresh air into the house. Uh, same temperature at the top floor down to the basement through zoning and the right size mechanicals. Security. These houses are consuming 67% less energy than an Ontario code built home today. So when you look at increased utility rates in the near future, this is giving buyers today the opportunity to be protected a little bit in the future as prices go up. And then just from an investment perspective, the resale, the durability and longevity of the homes as well, they are a better built home because there is attention to details. Take that and flip it into a community scale. Looking at a Ontario code-built home, they use about 110 gigajoules of energy a year. Times that by 100 homes, you're looking at 11,000 gigajoules of energy consumption from the grid. Even if you just go to net zero ready, which is everything except the photovoltaic on the roof, that takes you down to 3,700 gigajoules. 67% reduction in your infrastructure just like that. It also takes your GHG from 900 down to 150. That's an 83% reduction. So what I would say to that is we need to start looking at infrastructure sizing and what the impact of community scale net zero developments is going to do to your requirements in the future. Here comes the big caution. Um, much like you heard, Ontario Building Code is what builders build to to stay out of jail. Um, we are not a code built builder, so I can take confidence in saying that. Um, there's a lot of parameters that come around forcing change into a building industry that has been very reluctant to change um, and has probably seen the least amount of change in 40 years as any other um, realm. What they're going to need is access to building science specialists. We are looking at a trade shortage coming very soon, and it's already actually impacting the building industry. We need skilled labor trades, and we need to find solutions to address these labor shortages so that these homes are being built to specific requirements. When you talk about code and enforcing it from a municipal level to a builder, 
all of those guys that are building code today and don't want to change unless they're forced to are going to take shortcuts. The one thing with a net zero home is when your house gets air sealed and it gets tight, if the details are not looked after like flashing and water gets into that wall, you now have unintended consequences. Moisture is getting in there and the walls are not drying out and now you've got homes that are rotting, mildew, mold, and a whole bunch of other health issues. Affordability. These houses do cost more. From our perspective when we went into this program, it was all about implementing production-friendly techniques. So finding ways to do it cost-effectively without sacrificing quality and using off-the-shelf technology to make sure consumers were looking at components of their home that they're familiar with. So when you go into our net zero homes, the only thing that looks different is the solar panels on the rear of the roof and the inverter in the basement. The furnaces that we've used are new technology, but they look like a conventional furnace. Hot water tank basically looks like a hot water tank. They have air source electric heat pumps on the outsides of the home for your heating and cooling as your primary, but it looks like a small suitcase that would replace your air conditioning unit. Planning. Looking at site plans and how you're going to be putting homes on sites. We are faced with increased density requirements in a lot of urban areas. And when you look at what's required to net out, the same number of people living in apartments and townhouses are the same number of people living in small single family. And your roof space becomes your essential, most expensive real estate to be able to get the solar on the roof to offset the loads. So density is a huge challenge in moving forward uh, to net zero energy communities, but it's not impossible. Uh, technology is definitely advancing. And the keep it simple approach, much like I said, the house has to be understandable to the average consumer. It can't be like walking into a spaceship and having all kinds of gadgets and controls and not understanding any of the pieces of their home. We have to keep it very simple. Do we have a choice in advancing to net zero energy? We know the climate action change plan is coming. But also, based on Ontario building code, we see about a 20 to 25 percent increase on per code cycle. And based on where it's going today, by 2028, we will actually be at net zero energy anyways. So a lot of the builders that we speak with are actually starting discovery homes now and learning what those techniques are and how to be effective at it so that when it does become code, they're not behind the eight ball. There is a huge incentive for partnerships here. And much like no one likes to talk about giving credits to builders or reducing development charges and whatnot, we all know development charges increase. So what if there was the opportunity to say, if you're building a net zero uh, energy home, you stay at today's rate. If you're building Energy Star, you're going to pay this. And if you're gonna pay Ontario Building Code or Build to Code, you're gonna pay this. And it's a jump so that it almost encourages people to build a little bit better homes rather than just building to code. Uh, the other opportunity is look at property taxes. Maybe if a net zero energy community comes up, you look at giving a credit to the property taxes of those owners where they submit their bills annually to you showing that they've continually reduced their energy loads throughout the year. That in turn gives you data that is real life to monitor and investigate your infrastructure on a go-forward basis. There is a study by Avis Devine at the University of Guelph that shows that at a municipal level, there are huge benefits to implementing these programs. They don't take one year. They take about two to three years to see results, but they, there are legitimate results coming out of this. Um, consumers is another big challenge, but a great opportunity as well. Every industry has its own type of language that they speak to and understand and communicate. What we found when we rolled out this program is we put a huge emphasis on how we're relaying this information to consumers. When we listed four of our five homes for net up for sale, they took about two weeks before consumers started understanding the research, going to our website and learning about it, and all four sold in that week. They do have a premium and banks and appraisers and finance 
companies need to kind of understand what the upfront cost is versus the savings in the long term. But there are opportunities for buyers to start seeing this. Shared learnings. I think this is probably what I would like to see and what I've seen. Uh, the city of Pickering did a great job with this. They actually looked at a community within their municipality and said, this is where we want to learn. They set up a builder workshop. They engaged their builder groups from the Seton community and invited in some specialists. So the Canadian Home Builders Association, they had uh, some building science folks come in, just resources to help them understand and say, this is a test pilot and we want to start here. Take that plot of land and put it in phases and start step by step implementing the changes so you're learning with your partners and they have the opportunity to step into it slowly as opposed to being thrown right in and then you get back into the unintended consequences and failures. Um, the City of Guelph actually has a great program as well, the Blue Belt program. To see something like that where water right now is not today's focus but will be very soon to two-tier it and take an energy piece off of that and implement it as well. So if you do net zero ready, you get this net zero full is this uh, in combination with their water efficiency program. And then partners. There's a lot of money out there in industry that could be utilized to help implement these types of programs. The Enercan Eco EI program we did was co-funded by Owens Corning Canada and was hugely successful in helping the builders evaluate the different systems and find cost efficiencies in moving this forward. And that's my spot. So thank you very much uh, to Michael and Norm and Jennifer for their presentations. That was excellent. Um, we're now going to kick it off with a few Q&A from, from me. Um, the first question is to Jennifer. So based on the experience to date in building net zero energy, what is the greatest opportunity for seeing this in a scalable size from a municipal perspective? If you could elaborate on that. I would say that uh, from a municipal perspective, really partnering up with the, the developers and landholders within your area is key. Um, you're as strong as your partners are and the people that you work with. And again, back to the whole test pilot, um, don't mandate something until you fully understand what it takes to get there and who you need on your side to get to that. So do you have, do you have results of uh, some of the work that you've been involved with, with municipalities? Like, do you have quantifiable data that some supports a certain direction? At this time, we do not. So the houses will be monitored for a two-year period, um, and they're just taking possession uh, next week, actually. So those homes will be monitored for that period, but there are a lot of great municipalities that we've spoken with and um, done presentations with their builder groups, um, Region of Durham, City of Pickering, City of Markham, um, there's a lot of builders as well just taking the initiative to learn with a discovery home and find some trial and error. Great. Thank you. So the next question is for Norm. Um, I think you, you touched on it somewhat during your presentation, but a lot of the climate change discussion involves policies aimed to reduce fossil fuel consumptions. And, and by doing that, uh, big investments in large urban public transit in the urban areas and electric vehicles. So. Can you elaborate further about the transportation focus and how does that play out in a rural municipal context? Um, well, I, I guess the point I was uh, trying to drive home, pun intended, um, was that, uh, you know, a lot of the discussion, the public discussion, the media discussion about, it has been about investment in public transit and I, I don't think anybody that's had to go through Toronto um, doesn't want more cars off the road. I think uh, we obviously need to invest in, in urban public transit. But the way that we distribute our, our uh, public revenues doesn't benefit rural mobility solutions and we're, we're um, kind of behind the eight ball when it comes to that. Like the, the, the provincial gas tax, um, uh, access to that for uh, transit projects, uh, it just doesn't work for, for most uh, uh, rural municipalities, but rural uh, citizens that are 
paying two cents a liter um, are, 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 are fueling that uh, revenue. So um, I, I think it stands to reason that we should be looking for rural specific solutions and funding that. The, the community transportation pilot program, um, which the majority uh, of uh, recipients are rural, is uh, 2.2 million and it's a pilot. Um, you know, stack that up against uh, the, the urban transit project. So uh, I, I think we just need to spend a lot more time um, designing programs that can work for, for all uh, scales of municipality. We heard that from the, uh, the, the AMO uh, president this morning that uh, we have to be under the tent together and what works for some places doesn't work for others. So we have to be paying attention to that. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, you certainly talked about the industry's new contempora uh, cement. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit further about what are the greatest opportunities for municipalities to take advantage of that particular product? Uh, thank you. Um, we have cement producers uh, within 80 percent or 80 percent of Ontario's population live within uh, 100 kilometers of our of our four or five cement plants in Ontario. So this product will ultimately become the only cement that will be available probably some five to eight years from now. But we're trying to get uh, somebody to be the market leader to bring that product to market today. Uh, it's been four years since the Ontario Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing approved it in the building code it's, uh, we've now had sufficient testing um, with the Ministry of Transportation for pavements in Ontario. So sometimes the private sector is a little skittish uh, about pulling it into the market. So we're looking for municipalities to pull it into the market, especially since there's no cost premium for it. And municipalities are um, cement and concrete producers, single largest customer. And when you think of all of the infrastructure that you're building, uh, this is a good way to um, help bring a new product to market that will actually reduce greenhouse gases by 10% within your community. Great. So we do have time for just a few questions, and I see microphone number two. So please uh, state your name and municipality you're from, and uh, you've got 45 seconds to ask a question. How, how's that? I think I can be shorter. I'm Liz Huff, from, a councillor from Leeds in the Thousand Islands. My question is for Norm. Um, I loved the slide that uh, where you had tried to capture the anticipated increased costs in rural communities and noted the lower average income and this notion of impacted communities that you bring to us from California is really fascinating. So I, I just want to know if you've got any sense of the capacity of the Rural Ontario Institute, which I value greatly, to kind of spread some thinking about that, get us across Ontario, maybe some opportunities. Are there any chances for us to bounce off those ideas through any kind of workshops? Or how can we think about that more deeply and stay in the same big tent? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, thanks. Thanks, Liz. Um, well, we always, it's one of our core functions as an institute to facilitate dialogue among rural stakeholders. So um, we're always um, interested in having those conversations. I think the most fruitful conversations are when we have uh, a lot of different types of stakeholders in the room. So part of the challenge, let's say, in setting up some sort of fruitful dialogue is to have the right other uh, players and partners uh, in the room. So um, I would certainly welcome an opportunity to, to come in and talk about um, some of those rural challenges. I think the, the, the building stock issue is um, pretty critical for, for us to address. First of all, that's where the low in income households are most impacted. And the housing stock by and large in rural Ontario is much bolder uh, if you look at the data. Um, the likelihood that net zero is coming um, and, and going to make a significant impact in communities that aren't growing um, um, at, this, at the same increment that our urban centers are growing um, means that we have to address the existing housing stock. Um, so um, 
I would absolutely welcome a discussion about, about how we can make that work. Michael wants to add something? Uh, yeah, what I might suggest is um, John Godfrey, who chairs the Ontario Climate Action Group uh, under Glenn Murray and Premier Wynn. Uh, I know we've got Don, um, Don McCabe there, you know, who represents, where is he? Is he here yeah, today? There. He's, oh, there he is. <laughs> we, he represents the agricultural side, but it might be good to um, ask to come and make a presentation to the Climate Action Group just on some of the issues that, uh, you know, are important outside of agriculture for rural communities. Um, the, I'm part of the group along, along with Don and there's 14 of us and we've uh, spent the first year of our mandate looking at uh, the cap and trade system and the regulations around the cap and trade system. This year we're focusing more on transportation and buildings and uh, you know I'm I'm fairly confident that uh, you know that uh, our group would welcome and I'm sure the government would welcome any input on how this is going to impact uh, rural Ontario so I would encourage you to talk to John Godfrey and get a, a spot on our agenda so that we can hear from you directly on that great are there any further questions yes sir um, microphone number one then number two Thank you, uh, Neil Vincent. Uh, I'm a councillor in Huron County, uh, agriculture area, and being labeled sort of a tree hugger, I've planted 30 acres of trees on my own dime over the years, and that I've cut per acre use of fossil fuels by a third by adapting uh, minimum till and strip till policies. But it sounds like anybody that has adapted in agriculture and possibly doubled their soil organic matter like I have, which is probably the biggest carbon sink available in Ontario, uh, that we don't get in on the cap and trade because we've already done the work. Uh, my real thing is protecting my fire department, the cancer rates in firefighters. While I'm strong, a strong proponent of solar, you better have burn uh, elimination. And you can't put anything in a house that'll burn because those and, solar panels... And your question, the, sir, is? Uh, it's... Sorry, it's more of a comment, but please look at what Ministry of Labor will say if firefighters have to uh, go to buildings that have solar roofs. Okay, I think we have some acknowledgement of your comment. Thank you very much. Uh, microphone number two. We have a few minutes left. Uh, yes, uh, David Hanna I'm from Windsor. Uh, I was wondering uh, about uh, any possible improvements in uh, permeable uh, concrete and um, I was wondering if you could comment on the ratio of uh, improvements in recycling concrete versus uh, new quarry openings if you want. Um, the other question uh, would be for the net zero um, aspect of, uh, do you see that um, one aspect of uh, getting the public to buy in would be also aesthetic design as well as all the obvious uh, energy improvements that are Good questions. Uh, most Michael. Uh, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, recycled aggregate, um, I think you heard uh, uh, earlier this week from Baudouin Isa, the president of CRH, uh, where he said we're looking for municipalities' support uh, with the Ministry of Natural Resources and the aggregate resource uh, uh, project that is uh, currently under review. Uh, our, our view would be aggregates is a finite resource and we're trucking aggregates, uh, for example, for, to fuel the, the huge uh, building boom in the GTA. Sometimes we're trucking aggregates from as far away as the Kawarthas and, uh, and further uh, east and, and west and it's, it's not sustainable. So where you can use uh, for your ro road bases, for your um, sidewalk bases, uh, recycled aggregate, that would be uh, the first choice. So we're asking the minister 
to uh, specify um, recycled aggregate before virgin aggregate. On the pervious pavement question, um, all of our companies do provide pervious pavement. Pervious pavement basically looks like a Rice Krispie square. So when it rains, the water goes right through it, and right back into the groundwater table. Uh, it's good for parking lots, sidewalks, driveways, walking trails, uh, anything where you, you wouldn't use it to say in a, in a strip mall where you had a Walmart, uh, you know, that had a truck route to unload the back, you would use traditional pavement there. But in the front, uh, schools, churches, etc. cetera, uh, when you do have used pervious pavement, it does, uh, it eliminates the need to have stormwater retention and sewers on your, uh, and pipes on your property because the water goes right back into the ground. So I assume your organization, Michael, would have more information on permeable concrete? Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure people get into your hands. Great. So thank you very much. That wraps up our session. I want to thank uh, Michael, Norman, and, and Jennifer for providing their insights. And as a thank you on behalf of the AMO board, we have made a donation in your name to the AMO Municipal Disaster Relief Fund. I'd like to once again thank the Cement Association of Canada for sponsoring this session. So certainly the issue of uh, consumption of energy and climate change, there's nothing simple about that. And as a result, AMO will be continuing to uh, the discussion on climate change and energy in particular at a symposium in November in Mississauga. And the event will be aimed at growing the leadership municipal councils have shown on climate change and energy matters, helping you with low carbon energy planning and sharing the successes of those who have switched to non-greenhouse gas fuels and reduced costs. So look for more information from AMO in the coming weeks. So thank you very much again to our panelists. I'm going to turn it back to our new AMO president, Lynn Dolan, to draw, she's got an important job to draw the winner of the wrap-up prize and to provide our closing mm -hmm. remarks. Thank you very much.